they've created an environment that has sadly bamboozled people into thinking that if they have some sort of a metabolic health issue, it's okay, there's a pill to take care of it, rather than you need to take care of your body now so that you won't get in trouble later. Welcome to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. Our guest today is a former NFL player, Hollywood actor, fitness model, public speaker, and renowned trainer. From six years playing within the NFL to an extensive career in Hollywood, starring alongside Burt Reynolds and Clint Eastwood. Now in his 60s and with a physique that people half of his age would envy, he's now dedicated his life to inspire as many people as he can, move better, and live longer through health and fitness. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Pete the Swede Kosh to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. Well, Mr. Pete Kosh, thank you for joining us in Newport Beach today. Beautiful Newport Beach, thank you. You've not come too far though, where, where, where are you based? I'm Santa Monica based, so this is just, uh, just a short hike down uh, the 405. That's where I first came into starting to follow you on LinkedIn and I remember seeing these pictures of you on a beach motivating people to, to fitness. So um, have, you, have you been around that area for quite a while? I have. You know, I'm originally from Long Island, New York, and I went to the University of Maryland, played football there, captain of the football team there, and then banged around the NFL for several years. But it was a, it was a friend, that uh, a friend of mine from New York that moved to Los Angeles to pursue his dream as an actor in Hollywood, and he encouraged me to, to really do the same. And, uh, and he was also a fitness trainer and living that active lifestyle. And when I came out to visit him in Los Angeles, I immediately got what all the hype was about. You know, this was in the eighties and the lifestyle, the weather, the way, but it was more than the weather is the way people thought about living their lives um, much more outside. Again, that's due to the weather. However, the, what they were, for example, you know, the skateboard, inline skating, roller skate, there was every, anything that had to do with being on wheels and being outside was happening. And, you know, it's, it's cliche, but it's true. So many things that get invented the, in the world of, you know, just physical activity, recreational sport um, that eventually matriculate sort of into the Midwest and the rest of the country, they come out of Southern California. And there's a, there's a reason for that. And it's, it's, it's a culture of, a connectedness to nature. And I understand I've got friends that live like in the Rocky Mountains and, and there's a great connection to being outside and communing with nature there too. But in, in the unique way, um, because when you live in Los Angeles, you can get to the beach and you can get to the mountains in just both. You can, right, it's, it's, it's well known. Um, I've never done it because I don't snow ski, but you can, you can surf and and in winter, you can you could surf and snow ski in the same day, and it's been done by many many people. And it's just the it's unique to the world where we've got this type of terrain, and again, it lends itself to being people being very very physically active, which is attractive to me. Mm. You you're you inspired me, and as as a lot of the work that you do on social media, and and one of the things we're talking to my wife off, off camera about is your connection to JFK Jr. and. And it, it kind of, I suppose it was, it, it's quite an interesting time. Well, it's, it's an interesting time in the world, but it's, it's, I think it's quite interesting in, in the, a lot of the leaders around the world. You, you very rarely see people in that type of position that are pushing health, fitness, wellness, and, and connecting the fact that we have got a, an obesity crisis, we've got a health crisis, the, the, the cost for everything from back injuries to health, lifestyle related um, disease is, is huge and it's not getting any better. And, and yet many people around the world that are sort of leading and promoting these, these agendas are, are not in the best health itself. So what's, um, what's your experience after meeting someone like him firsthand and, and, and the, the view on actually promoting health for the, um, for, for, for the country? Because I, I guess it was his father that was probably also one of the first people that, that started to introduce that into schools and things. So, so what, what do you know about that? Well, maybe it's um, not a coincidence. I first met uh, Bobby Kennedy Jr. at a gym uh, through my, my friend, Andrea Logan, uh, who is a, a, a personal trainer, but that had met Bobby earlier, a few years before me, at a gym, 
and uh, and it all sort of came full circle. I mean, the man is legitimately in the gym working that hard. Um, I don't know, you know, I don't know why exactly he goes to the gym, but he's probably wired like me, which is to say, even if I had all the resources and all the room I wanted to have to have my own home gym, I wouldn't use it. I wouldn't build it because I know I wouldn't use it. Because for me, like a lot of people, certain people, we much prefer to go someplace to get our to, to get our fitness going. And because it's a there's a social, an undeniable social component to it. One that's very important to me. Um, I remember years ago being in an acting class and it's kind of sad but true and, and sometimes in, when it was a break in the action you got a, a room full of young you know 20s and 30s attractive people ambitious people artistic people that are following their heart because it's such a difficult business and we talk about like what we did when we weren't in acting class and weren't at our part-time job and on so many of these actors we were ending we were in bars you know all the time and that was that was what they did with their sort of idle time and I remember thinking like man I spend a lot of time at the gym I don't spend a lot of time at bars and um, thank goodness that I'm I'm wired this way um, you know it, it did come from having an athletic background but I remember thinking as much as I'd like to hang out with some of these they're lovely people I just don't want to be I don't want to spend and I realized you can and I was single and you can meet you know, uh, uh, you know, an attract, your p potential uh, relationship in in that setting, but you can also meet them and and for me, preferentially meet them in in a gym, right? I love I love women who work out, fit women, and you know, Bobby Kennedy is that guy that shows up at the gym. He works very very hard, and it's been an interesting. I'm, I'll, I'll share this. I have to share this because when I met him three and a half years ago. I don't, who knew that he would run for president at this time, right? So fast forward, he's running for president. And, you know, it, it's been interesting to see the way folks react to him at Gold's Gym. Because yeah, he's, he's a pretty, he was a pretty famous guy before he ran for president. Um, but he wasn't. Listen, Arnold Schwarzenegger's over here. <laughs> Carl Weathers, Apollo Creed is working out right over there. And there's Bobby Kennedy working out. All right, whatever. And... Um, since then, and I saw this happen myself, um, he's, he works up by himself and he's, and, he, and he's out there and he's, and he's on a machine in the outdoor area and, and truth be told, he does work when it's a sunny day. He does take his shirt off, but he's looking for his vitamin D. I get it. And um, he looks great. And, and somebody comes up and says, uh, hey, hey, Mr. Kennedy, can I, get my, can I have my picture made with you? He says, fine. And by the, then they go and they go like, and he puts his shirt on. And they go like this, and, they and by the time they turn around like this, uh, there's 35, 40 people, like with their camera out, you know, like in a semicircle. And, uh, and he, go he goes, come on, come on, you just come over here next. And then it takes another one and another one. And then somebody says, hey, you know what, let's, let's just all make a, it's going to take a long time. Let's just all make a team picture here, you know, group picture. And Bobby says, no, 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 no. No, anybody here who wants their picture made with me, that's fine. Just let's make a line. And he organized everybody into a line and everybody went, okay. And they got there and he just, and he just stood there in the sun and made pictures with everybody. And I'm like, it, it's, he's, he's exceptional. Yeah, yeah no, he's, he motivates me. I think he's, I think he can motivate, I think he's motivating to anybody, regardless of how you align yourself with politically, um, because he's, uh, he leads from the front and he looks the part and, um, it's not important to me that he doesn't sound the part, you know, he's got a, 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 a genetic condition that affects his voice. And we've talked about that a little bit. Um, but you know, it's been my experience and I think it's everybody's experience that once you listen to him a little bit, you get used to it and it's not a, it's not an issue anymore. The reality is the, the vessel that's holding that, that voice together is extremely healthy and uh, a role model for the rest of us. And yes, Matthew, you know, with the, the United States, um, a leader in the world in, in so many areas like technology and sending rockets into space, but we also lead the world in obesity, which is exactly <laughs> the, you know, uh, no matter what, USA is number one. I'm not sure, you know, uh, 
but that's an area where it's, it's a disaster. 80% of the adult population of the United States is overweight. 43% are clinically obese. And it's not the trend. It hasn't capped off yet. So it's, it's continuing to rise. It's, it's a multifactorial problem. I'm trying to be part of the solution as a, as a fitness coach and as, I think, a voice of reason. I don't have any radical thoughts about helping people get physically fit. I've got thoughts based in, in, in principles that, unfortunately, um, due to less and less uh, of PE, physical uh, activity classes, physical education classes in, 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 in uh, elementary schools, due to the reduction in that and, and so many things that are phones that are keeping kids more sedentary, less active, um, the foods that we eat and the lack of the lack of political leadership when it comes to, I think, not only policy, but just the eyeball test of wouldn't it be nice if we just had a politician that we could respect and not only the things that they say, but the way they look and understand that that physique that Bobby Kennedy has is a product of a disciplined mindset and also the, the will to go out and put the hard work in, and that includes uh, the, the, the choices that he's making nutritionally. Introducing the next big thing in functional training, the Escape Barrow, a revolutionary training tool that combines a loaded farmer's carry with a sled push to develop hip, grip, and core strength. Developed in partnership with Pete Holman, inventor of the TRX Rip Trainer and Nautilus Glute Drive, the Escape Barrow can be rolled, pushed, dragged and carried. The Escape Barrow packs a punch with an impressive load capacity of 440 pounds and with a two-stage galvanized paint covering process, it's also ideal for outdoor use. So head over to escapefitness.com forward slash barrow. That's escapefitness.com forward slash barrow to find out more. Enjoy the rest of this episode. I was reading you, you mentioned one of our one of the one of your biggest competitors is the is the pharmaceutical industry. Number one. What why do you say that? Yeah, because they've created an environment that has sadly bamboozled people into thinking that if they have some sort of a metabolic health issue, it's okay. There's a pill to take care of it rather than you need to take care of your body now so that you won't get in trouble later. Um, they've done this through marketing and advertising. You know, it's been stated before. I, I never heard Bobby Kennedy. I, I might take some credit here. I, I never heard Bobby Kennedy say it uh, when, he, when he speaks publicly until I mentioned it to him. When we, were take, when we were hiking together in Santa Monica Mountains four or five months ago. But probably he knew this anyway. But I said, because as, as most, even the most casual fan of Bobby Kennedy know, he's an environmental lawyer, and that's leaked over into lawsuits with pharmaceutical companies, and he won. He's winning, he's won lots, of, he's very successful, and he's very smart, but he's also, he's always representing the downtrodden and the people that are taken advantage of and the pharmaceutical companies and chemical companies, Monsanto, et cetera, have done a lot of things that have harmed people. But what I told him, and I've heard him repeat, and I think it's important to repeat this, that, you know, we've, there are basically 200 nations in, you know, uh, in, in the world and only, and they all consume pharmaceuticals, only two of them, is it, is it, permissible by law to advertise on national TV. Those two are the United States and, um, and of all places, you know, New Zealand, go figure. And everybody else, everybody else, Germany, France, everybody else has figured out that's a bad idea. We're not going to let people, we'll let people market in their own ways, but not on national TV. And now the pharmaceutical companies, and remember, they own n not only the, the prescription medications, but the over-the-counter, and they are dominating um, when the, the, the TVs, you know, this is, this is, you know, the old-fashioned TV and the cable TV, which is really slowly going away. That's, by the way, there's a connection there, because more and more people are watching podcasts and streamers like me. And less and less people watching things that they can find on cable and network news. 
Um, but, but, but more than 50% of all ad revenue on network news and network shows comes from pharmaceutical companies. They dominate that. Why? Because it's an older population and they just go right after them. And then those people get, you know, get the, the, you know, uh, I saw a commercial, I won't mention the, the, the drug, but it was, it was for folks with type two diabetes, which is nearly, you can't quite say a hundred percent reversible and curable if someone has type 2 diabetes because what drives type 2 type 1 diabetes is type you're born with type 2 diabetes is the kind that you get when you're older when you get overweight and and there's just a tiny less than one percent of folks that even if they maintain a very very lean body they're still gonna have type 2 diabetes but, but by and large 99 percent of the folks they get overweight sedentary they and their body begins to react in such a way, the hormones, it's a, it's, a, it's a hormonal cascade of things that make you sick. And then you, the ability for your own body to control your own blood sugar levels, that balance between glucose and insulin that happens in your bloodstream, it goes sideways. And you're going to die unless you take a medicine to help you you know, stave off, that, help you control that, that, that condition. And there's this commercial, I'm watching this very obese person is singing a song that her uh, blood sugar is a little high and she's singing it's just a little off you know it's just a little like a little problem it's not a little problem it's a really really dangerous condition you have if you have type 2 diabetes and you must do everything humanly possible to fix it to correct it and that means losing weight through proper nutrition and exercise, not drugs. I mean, drugs is, but when people go, but a drug is available to me, and I could talk to my doctor about that. Well, um, it's, it's a very difficult message. And this puts the, I have many medical doctor friends, mostly first line practitioners, and diabetes is something they talk about all day long. And they're up against it. The doctors feel like they're up against the wall because of the, the, the folks come in and they go, well, hold it, you say my, my, my glucose is high, but can't I just take a medicine? Because he start, no, I want you to do diet and exercise. Can I, what's, is it a pill or a shot, you know? <laughs> so it's just, it's, I, you know, I, I think Bobby Kennedy's talked about it, um, but uh, I'm talking about it. If, if we could make one, if I, you know, if I was king of the uh, United States for a day, the president, I think, I think, well, to be a handful of things, but one of the most important things that I'd want to uh, try to do right away would, would, would make sure that would, would I guess it's the FCC and, and, and figure out a way that we don't let pharmaceutical companies advertise on TV anymore. We're going to, we're going to put a hard line in the sand and take that away and let doctors reclaim their territory. And as opposed to being all the blowback they get from the, from the patients who are watching TV too much and exercising not nearly enough. So that's my little rant, my little rant on that. But I think Bobby's, uh, uh, Kennedy, I, I don't want to speak for him that he supports that position, but the position I know that he does support is we need to, we all need to exercise intensely every day. It's going to make you better. I tell my, my personal training clients, it's not only a you situation. Um, think about, how important it is that you know collectively the healthier we are in your in your house in your community in your town in your state in the country the better we all are hmm. i was talking to someone I, I did an interview a little while ago and they were saying you know very essentially you if you have a strong body you have a strong mind and um, and weak people and it, this was a bit of a generalization but weak people that are not healthy um are also not you know don't have the, the strong mind in, in certain situations. And so it's, it's, those two are obviously very well connected, but if you are healthy and strong, that affects your outlook on life. And, and my guess is how you interact with, with the rest of the world. So I'd, I'd go along with that statement that you said, really. Well, I, I'd like to, I have a, I can add to that. Uh, one of my, one of my favorite, you know, podcasts uh, is Dr. Huberman. Mm -hmm. And he's a neuroscientist that I came across when he was a guest on Joe Rogan. And I was, right away, I was leaning in and I was just listening to it. I didn't know what he looked like. And then I had a chance to go and, and pull it up and see what Dr. Huberman looked like. And I, he's very strong. He is a impressive physique and he's a PhD in neuroscience. And he was, one of the things, 
that he was discussing. And this really resonated with me. And I share it with everybody that I can. And he said, when you lift heavy things, when you're doing strength training, by the way, not steady state cardio training, but strength training in particular, he said it elevates, it, 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 it cajoles your body to elevate your, your level of testosterone. That's in both men and women. In round gross terms, yes, women have testosterone, but about one-tenth of what men have. So either way, it's okay. It still increases whatever it is that you're, we're at whatever level that you're at. So lifting heavy weights stimulates your body to produce more testosterone. And what does that do? It does a whole bunch of different things that you, you, everybody can kind of imagine. And what he said in particular, it makes having more testosterone in your system makes doing hard things feel better. I, I think I got that right. Yeah, I think you're right. I, if, I if I don't have the wording <laughs> perfect, it's pretty, it's, it's, it's serviceable. It makes doing hard things feel better. Now, how important is that? Because what turns people off from wanting to work out? Shoot, it's hard work. It kind of actually makes me feel like I hurt a little bit when I do it. And that for a lot of people is just, it makes them uncomfortable. Shut it down, out they go, never come back. And that's, that is not only a sad characteristic of, of many people, um, but it's fixable. And I'm not discouraged when I, when I see people say that or hear people say that because I've got enough experience and been around. Yes, I'm a former professional athlete, but I've, but my, I haven't trained in my 30 some odd years of being a professional strength coach. I haven't focused on other professional athletes. Many people ask me that. Do you work with young athletes and all that? Actually, no. I work with the general population, and I'm expert at that population. They are physically regular folks, many of them exceptionally uh, strong in their academics and things, but, but they, don't have, they didn't get the kind of genetic gifts that I had as an athlete. So what? And it's and I, when, when I hear things like what Dr. Huberman said, because it, truth be told, there have been times where I've, I've thought to myself, why is it lifting heavy things makes me feel good and that person over there, not so much. And when Dr. Huberman said that it's, tes, it's lifting heavy things produces more testosterone and makes lifting. So you, it's, it's, you need to break through, get that person Heavy things is relative, but relative to that person's strength, where at whatever station they're at, at whatever age, without lim whatever, whatever personal limits they may have, there's always a way to help people, to coach them to get stronger. And if you can get them to buy in, trust this process, it won't happen overnight, but it happened, it'll happen faster than you, you think. Somebody who is deconditioned, middle-aged and deconditioned, can start to see some effects, some positive effects to their musculature in six weeks. Um, once you're already fit and maybe you change up your, 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 your programming a little bit, do, you know, you, it's you really hard to even see any changes in six weeks because you're so far, you know, like me, I'm lifting weights for, you know, 45 years already. I'm so deep into this thing. I, I can't see any kind of major, you know, results in six weeks, but that's the beauty I tell, you know, tell somebody says, you know, but I'm 52 and I've really never been fit in my life. I go, wow, I'm going to tell you something. There's something actually very exciting about your station because you will see gains and results. If, you, if you're doing things right, listen to me and get the food right and, and do your strength training in a, in a safe way based on the, the, the principles of, of, of neuroscience and, and, and the way muscles work. And I'll say the beauty is you can feel something in six, eight weeks, because I, I generally start people with a 12-week program, no less when we get out there, uh, 10, 12 weeks, and you and, and, and everybody, I can say 100% of the time, if people are compliant to the strength training and the nutrition in particular, that that one-two punch, they will build muscle, appreciable muscle benefit 
that will have other people commenting that they look better. And these are people that have gone decades without a compliment like that. Imagine the power, this is truly the power of an organized strength training program which is fortified by proper nutrition and nobody is uh, outside the benefit. There's nobody who's got, oh man, I don't know my genetics, I'm not sure I've got the right gene. No, everybody, you, we, here's what we have. We all have 206 skeletal bones, 646 skeletal muscles. We've got these 180 articulating joints. What do they do? Uh, the muscles pull on uh, the bones and the joints allow us to articulate and move, all controlled by the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord that innervates everything. Okay, we have this beautiful system. Now let's put it to work and let's see what we can do with your body. And I promise you, you do it right, look better, and not, I'm not even getting into the mental stuff about how you can feel better. But to have, to have a body that feels firmer, stronger, and by the way, stronger people are more useful in general. They are, um, and we need more of them. And I'm, I'm here to encourage that, to help you and encourage you. And if, if I can just, if, if somebody can just kind of lean into what I'm saying and give it a shot, I, I promise you'll get a good outcome. You, you've been around in the fitness space for a while and seen a number of trends. Uh, strength training with people like Joe Rogan and Huberman uh, has become, in the last few years, a lot more recognized as this is muscle is the, is the organ of longevity. Uh, we should be strength training as opposed to cardio. But there has been a number of phases where there's been other things, particularly a heavy reliance on cardio to get, get in shape. You obviously came in, uh, or a big part of your younger years was, was around people like Joe Weider and the Arnold Schwarzenegger and the Franco Columbos, etc. So how do you see those two things connected? Like what was going on at that time and how did you view what you was doing as a profession and, and, and the connection to where we are today? Yeah, you know, my, actually my earliest rec rec recollection was, uh, I'm 61 now, I was born in 19... 19- 62, and I remember what, uh, seeing Jack LaLanne on TV in, on black and white, and I thought that was really interesting. I'm like, Mom, what are you looking at? You know, so that was, that was the earliest. It took me a little while. Uh, I was a really young kid at that point, but, but Jack LaLanne, who isn't spoken about so much now, but, but he, it, you know, and you could probably go back before that, even before my time at Charles Atlas, I kind of like that history of strength training and bodybuilding and, and, and muscular development because it really truly has been around. You know, everybody wants to think, uh, gosh, it's 2023 and, uh, you know, that, and that there's so many, you know, fitness uh, uh, influencers, you know, we all have all of our social media and, and they all, you know, a young person might look at them and go, wow, this is, I've never seen anything like, it's been around seven, you know, so I'm talking about 60, Jack LaLanne was, was working out on, TV, taking people through a workout 60 years ago on black and white TV. So it's been around a long time. There's really not that much new. The new part is when the, when the, the, the exercise science guys, you know, and the medical doctors, you know, when they, when they start to, uh, uh, Peter Atia, I think, is doing this better than anybody else. His, I just read his book out, Live, and I've been listening to his podcast because he's a medical doctor that's very, very fit, lives a fitness lifestyle, always has, and is leading from the front. And he's, and he's really interested uh, in, in how the, the, the data, which can, you know, the exercise science guys and the data and the guys that work with pro athletes, you know, how you find that intersection of how, um, what in the, the, the specific types of exercise that are going to elicit the most, you know, benefit for his patients. So he's got this great pipeline and group of researchers and, and I, I recommend his book. It's, a, it's, it's not an easy book to read. And, and, uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm a guy with a liberal arts degree, all right? But I'm like, you know, if you remember the old uh, commercials for, you had Hertz was the number one car rental company and Avis was second. And Avis used to say in their commercials, but we try harder. So I don't have a, 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 a you know, a scientific degree, uh, um, but that's okay. So I've been, I, 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 shoot, I went back to college in my 40s and I studied uh, biology, chemistry, physiology, and anatomy so I could understand the literature.
because I didn't, I didn't have that benefit because I didn't study that the first time I went to college. So I wanted that because once you can read the literature and understand these articles, then for me as a, as a, as a coach, it just opens it all up. Then I take those fairly complex ideas and I can, I can distill them down into just a regular conversation with people. But Joe Weider was a, ch a man that I had a chance to meet. What a blessing that was. And when I was playing uh, uh, for the Kansas City Chiefs and living in Los Angeles in the off season, uh, um, with the Weeder magazine, actually somebody that worked there, Dr. Fred Hatfield, who was a world champion, Dr. Power, Dr. Squat. <laughs> uh, and he was a, a dear, became a dear friend and a mentor to me. And I would train with him in the off season. Wow. And, uh, he was one, and he was the, he was the chief science editor. He's, he's uh, they call him Dr. Squat because he had a PhD. He was actually, his PhD was actually in sports psychology. But he had a strong biology background, and he was the senior science editor for all the Weeder magazines back then, back when people bought magazines, and you know today it would be the online presence. But Joe Weeder, he introduced me to Joe Weeder, and he asked me if I would um, if I would do a photo shoot for one of their magazines, and that that was great fun. So that, so my particular photo shoot and article was much more uh, you know athlete you know, centric rather than, a, than purely lift the bodybuilding. But he says, Hey, you have a great physique, you know, for an NFL player. And I think there's, I think our, I think our readers would be interested in that. So that was, that was a great thrill for me, but Joe Weider had an enormous, an enormously positive impact on people because he got them moving and smartly his wife, Betty was, was very, very fit and he included her. And I think, they were, I think it was a great blessing for all of us that, that, in, that were able to get a little bit caught up in some of that hype, because he was a good promoter, but he, he would get us, you know, the Joe Weider, uh, uh, you know, muscle density principles, that he had these silly names that he wrote about. But it was, it, you know, an inside story was, so Joe Weider would write an article and he would, you know, claim this is a Weider principle, Weider principle, he had a list of Weider principles that made your muscles grow faster. And then he would hand the article to, to Fred Hatfield, his science editor, and he would go and fix it <laughs> and make it science-based. And, and, then, and then they would go ahead and publish that. So that was a little bit of how, how that yeah. worked over the years. Um, and then, uh, you know, yeah, I was the kid that had the, the skinny kid that had a weight room in the basement and a picture of Arnold Schwarzenegger on, on, on my wall. My favorites were Arnold and, and Dave Draper. Did you meet those guys? Yeah, I, did you do any? I saw an interview with you and Dave, was it? Was it on YouTube? Oh, I, you know, I, I met Dave Draper before everybody had a cell phone in their pocket. I'd never had a chance to interview him. I oh. met Dave Draper in the, in the 80s in the Weeder building. Uh, and I think I was just over there to meet Fred for Fred Hatfield for lunch. And Dave Draper was standing in the lobby. And I said, holy cow, I'm going to bother you for a second, Dave, because, you know, uh, you, you meant the world to me when I was reading the magazines and when I was in high school and on Long Island. And he said, thank you. He was very humble. And, and he said, thank you very much. And, um, and we had a nice little conversation. So, but, but, but he, he was one of my, my early heroes, you know, the blonde bomber. So I, 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 I so deeply appreciated them. Here's the thing. When I went, I was fortunate enough to go to a high school that had a very strong football program but had a crappy weight room, but this was the, this was the late seventies. And, but the head coach says the head coach was a physical specimen himself. And he was he was still young. He was maybe 40 and he had played his college ball at Kansas state. And he says, Pete, you have a chance to be really good at this game of football. I was in ninth grade, ninth grade at the time. I wasn't on a varsity and he was the varsity coach. And he says, you have a chance to be really good, but here's what you do. you you look, you got things we can't coach. You got your tall, you're fast, you, you like the game, you're aggressive, you're quick. Can't, can't teach any, but here's the thing. You're, you're skinny and you're weak. We can fix that, right? <laughs> we fixed that in the weight room. And he says, you gotta go get it. And uh, I asked my dad for some weights to put in the basement because I wanted to be able to lift weights at home. And the only coaching I had was the magazines. And it sounds so cliche, but truly Joe Weider and also our Red Iron Man magazine, it was like a small magazine. And they, they literally put the sets, exercises, sets, reps in there. And it's crazy when you're like 15 trying to do like a pro bodybuilder workout. And I figured that out the hard way. You get so <laughs> sore, you can't believe it. Um, but it gave me something that was inspirational. I, I didn't know then that high level football players 
train a bit differently than bodybuilders. We use a different, we, there is some crossover and some similarity, but we do, football players do things like power cleans and deadlifts and um, snatches um, and then a, a, just a load of more explosive work that just, you just won't, bodybuilders just aren't going to go down that path. There's not a reason for them to. And it, uh, do things like a power clean is a, is a pretty, um, it's a pretty good learning curve. Like you're not going to learn it right away. It takes quite a bit of time and, and it takes high level professional coaching to teach you how to do it. It was when I went to U the University of Maryland and my, my strength coach there, Frank Costello, when he, he taught me, as he taught the whole team, how to do these complex exercises that do benefit. And, they, and the reason they benefit football players is because they make football players more powerful. Um, and when you step onto a bodybuilding stage, there's no need for power. There's just a need to express the, 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 your level of muscularity, muscle density, symmetry, balance. And all those things, no requirement for power. But on a football field, that's what we needed. Yeah. Um, and, but those collectively, those people had a huge influence on me. Um, later on, I learned that, the, you know, when I got to college, that there was more to life uh, and more things to benefit me from doing a bodybuilding workout. When my goal was to be the best football player I could be, I learned those and integrated those exercises. Um, that later on in my life, I, was, uh, uh, I owned a, a CrossFit gym. And I was a CrossFit coach. And those in, in my history of, of uh, the Olympic lifts um, that I learned uh, as a as a in college and the NFL, we continued those. Um, it benefited benefited me them, and um, that but that 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 I was very blessed because I, I was introduced to a very broad spectrum when it, in field in, in terms of strength training, conditioning, athletic development, how to make people jump higher, run faster. I don't do much of that anymore. But I, I still got uh, that, that skill set, and it's exciting to me because from time to time I do meet people that want to run faster, and there's a, there's a very particular you know curriculum for that. But at the at the foundation of all of it, pick up heavy stuff, <laughs> keep and be consistent about it, and bit by bit start adding weight to the bar. And everybody, I promise you that that it's called progressive overload. It actually works. It'll make you better and it'll prepare your body so that you can be as good as you can possibly be when you're 85. That's the goal. You were, you're in the NFL. I had a friend, a neighbor who was, uh, I think he was also in the Chiefs, which I believe you're, you're in. You, you did this, from, from what I, I read, you was in the Bengals, Chiefs, Raiders. Um, and you had a, he, he always said, which is very true for him, NFL stands, stands for not for long. Yeah. Um, you, you managed six years, which, which is a pretty decent career. What did you do from a training perspective to be able to perform at a, an elite level for, for that period of time, would you say? Yeah, that's, that, you know, that, that's, that's such a good question and, and, and a big topic, but I, I've had a lot of time to think about it. And I think every guy that played in the NFL, with very few exceptions, for the rest of their life, they think, I, if I had just done some things differently, I could have played longer and maybe better. Mostly you want to play longer. I mean, your pride says you want to play better, but your, you know, your bank account thinks, see, yes, I want to play longer. And, uh, you know, the average career length in the NFL is 3.2 years. So if I played six and you say, that's pretty good, you about doubled it. And um, here's what I would change. I, as, because I wasn't a strength coach when I was a player. I acquired that education later. Um, I would... I would pay more attention to the health of my joints and my body and less attention to abject strength. I, I, there's, I had a good idea that it was very important for me to be strong. And then you add some like plyometric exercises, jumping exercises, and, and you, and so that one plus one, you know, you do a strength, you get very strong, and then you get very sort of springy and bouncy, and you put those two together and you get power. And that's the whole idea. And I think I had my head around that, but I was tipped too far personally. I was tipped too far into the strength thing. And, uh, you know, I had a 500 pound bench press, and I can tell you for a fact, nobody needs to bench press 500 pounds <laughs> to be 
a very, very good defensive end in the NFL. Now, I think you need to be able to bench press, you know, at least 350, you know, because you weigh almost 300. So, you know, it's sort of relative. I mean, I played at about 280. Um, mm -hmm. But I have, uh, when, I, when I first got with the Raiders, Howie Long was on the team. And he's about three years older than me. He, had, he was the best. He was the standard of my position. And he's a great, great guy too. And very generous and helpful of other younger players when he was a player. And he was the highest paid you know, defensive end in the whole league. And everybody was like, that's the guy. And I played the same position. And I was a starting defensive end in Kansas City. But then I had a bunch of orthopedic surgeries that set me back. And then uh, Al Davis signed me to the Raiders to be Howie Long's backup, which felt fine for me because I just wanted a spot. And I had to make that team. And what was interesting because, when, and I did make that team, and, and I learned from Howie. And one of the things I learned was when he went into the weight room, because we all work out, typically work out in groups, like the defense one day and they bring in the offense the next one. The defensive ends kind of hang out together like this. And although physically, Howie and I were very, very close. I'm 6'6", he's 6'5", I was 275, he was 275, I think. Um, he was probably 20%. He was using 20% less weight than me on everything, maybe 30%. You know, if I was bench pressing 405 for reps, he was probably 335 for the same reps, you know. And that was, every, that was everything. But when you played football, and, and remember, when you're practicing, you're very often practicing drills against each other. So you're hitting... Uh, your fellow, I'm hitting Howie and Bob Golick and, and, you know, and, and my fellow Bill Kell, the other guys, and you can feel the power that guys have, even in practice, believe me. And everybody, everybody knew, everybody felt it, that Howie was a uniquely powerful individual. It wasn't, but it wasn't that 500 pound bench press you felt. You, when he pushed his arms into you, it felt like a, some kind of a, a, a cartoonish superhero that he would hit you in the chest so hard that you, it all, in your mind's eye, I was like, this fist might just go through my <laughs> chest wall. I, he, it was just, boom, it was so sudden and powerful and, and dramatic. It just, and that was, a, we're just practicing, we're just doing a drill. And then, I'd, and then, of course, we'd line up and you watch, you know, you're, you're playing with him and you're watching him and he is just destroying guys. Just it just seems like his strength was from a different, just he had a different plan, just a different sorts of cables and muscles instead of muscles. Something was going on, <laughs> and it wasn't because he could lift so much weight. And that's what I learned. And he's like, you know, I asked him about it, and I go, he goes, you know, Pete, I want to be strong, but I, I just, you know, I'm at the, I'm at the, it's, 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 it's my opinion that. If, if I'm in there spending so much time trying to be stronger than I really am, I think I'm built to be a certain, I'm strong and I'm built there. But I know with my leverage and my technique, which is something I, that, you know, he really worked on. Um, he knows that that's where I'm at. My, he knew where he was at his best. And if I go and try to do a couple extra dumbbell flies or something with you afterwards, Pete, I just, I'm not trying to tell you what to do, but I know me. And I know it's not going to make me better. It's going to make me more tired. And I'd rather be, you know, finish my workout and I could look at my, study my playbook. <laughs> you know, like he was such, he was so reasonable and mature. And he, and he understood exactly how to get the most out of his body and his mind. And that's why he's in the Hall of Fame. Because, um, you know, people, you, you know, when you think of Howie Long, if they get, they'll show some old highlights of him sacking the quarterback. He could do that because what you, what you don't see was how, how it, with, with the intellect that he approached the game as a professional athlete. This was his profession, and he taught me that. Um, and it was, it was in that, that lesson, that's just not about being a football player. You take that with you in every area of your life. Hmm. Very interesting. You, um, you had an interesting progression into 
into Hollywood. Uh, probably, I guess one of the most famous things that I read was was your um, your role with Clint Eastwood. Uh, what, what, how did how did that how did you end up acting in a major movie like that? Yeah, so I had a I had a friend from New York that he was nine years older, Perry Perry Rosen. He was like, uh, and I met him at the I met him at the bodybuilding gym. So I so because the weight room at the high school wasn't very good, and I was in high school, and I wanted um like my next thought was I was I, I was. I was advancing more than just the, the the weights that I had in my basement, and I thought, what can I do? And somebody said, you know, there's a bodybuilding gym in the next town over, Rab's gym in Lindbrook, and I uh, I got I, I got myself over there. I didn't even have a car, I had a bummer ride or whatever it took to get over there, and I and I joined, and it was full of it was a converted supermarket, had a karate dojo in the back, and bodybuilding in the front, and no cardio equipment. It was just a hardcore, and it, I loved it. Smelled funny. I loved everything about it, right? <laughs> and it was full of guys that worked really, really hard. Guys in their like late twenties and thirties and forties, and they were, and there, were no, there was maybe two women, you know, members. You know, there was no women, and it was just perfect for me. And I met this guy named Perry Rosen, and he had a he had a good physique. He was a little bit older. We became fast friends, and we always stayed in touch. And then when I went away to college, and we stayed in touch even before cell phones, where it was like a big deal to call your friends up and. And then um, he, around the time of my senior year, he had gone through some things. And, he, and, and by the way, so Perry, Perry owned a small business in New York City. And he said to me, he would always say to me, but really, I'm an actor. I'm an actor. And I did this off-Broadway play. And I just shot a, a, a commercial for uh, Sprite. And, uh, it's, and I'm going to make this thing go. I'm going to make it work. And, he, and I go, and okay. But all the years kept ticking by and he was barely ever working. And then something happened with his business and he goes, I'm going to, you know, it's a, I feel like God's telling me something. I lost my small business and uh, he had some, just one or two friends in Los Angeles. And he goes, I'm, it's time for me to get out of New York and I'm going to take the shot. I'm going to go to Hollywood and make it as an actor. And he, and he did, he moved. And uh, he was also a personal trainer and so we stayed in touch, and when the uh, season ended, my first season in the NFL ended, he said, come out and visit me. And I, you know, I didn't, I was playing with the Bengals, I didn't want to live in Cincinnati, I was single, there was nothing holding me there, all I had to do was work out wherever I was. Off-season workouts were not nearly organized in the NFL back then, it was go, just, we'll see you in six months, just be in shape. <laughs> and so I went to Los Angeles, and he says, he showed me one of his auditions, and he he took me to an audition. He says, here's how it works. And uh, he said, you could, you know, you could do this, Pete. You could do this. And I said, really? I never thought about it like that. He goes, look, I'm, I'm, I'm like, he pulled a, you know, he pulled the curtain back. He's like, no, this is how you become, this is a, pro, this is how you be a professional actor. And I, I'm, he goes, man, I got my SAG card. I can help you do it. And that was it, you know, and he got me interested. And I was, uh, I got an agent and uh, I was very fortunate right away. And I, like, I think it was my second audition. I booked a national commercial for Ford trucks. And I got my SAG card. As people who know about acting know that's a big deal. And I was making a little money, and I had a SAG card. I would just keep going to the gym. We worked out together every day. And then I booked another commercial, and it started to happen for me. And my friend Perry's like, holy cow, I didn't know. What did I create? A monster. I didn't know. And then I got an audition, and my agent said, they're being very secretive about this, but you got to drive over to the Warner Brothers lot. I'm, I'm like, where's that? He's like, it's over in Burbank, and, you know, figure it out. And, uh, and I auditioned, and I walk into this room, and there's, like, about maybe 120 guys that are, like, my size or bigger, because the script had read... Uh, uh, Swede enters the room, six feet seven, 285 pounds. Well, I'm six, five and six, six and a half. And at that time I was about 280. So I'm like, I don't know. And all kinds of just big, big guys. And they were auditioning everybody in town. They're very, but they didn't say who was in the movie or what the name of the movie was. I knew it was a military thing. And I auditioned and I got a call back, which is, which means another opportunity to audition again. This time they're going to put me on, on tape. And uh, again, they, now, right now they whittled it down to about 20 gigantic guys. And I learned my lines with my friend Perry coaching me. And I found out, my agent calls me up two days later and he goes, man, you got that part. You won't believe this, man. You just got a part on a, in a Clint Eastwood movie called Heartbreak Ridge. I said, get out of here. 
and uh, and it was uh, like a dream come true. And it, it and and so many movies are made in Hollywood. Ninety nine percent of them go away after a few years. Even Clint Eastwood movies. Clint Eastwood's made I something like eighty movies, but and he's one of the biggest stars in history. But really, people only remember or talk about or they even rerun maybe seven or eight of those movies right uh, and there's 70 movies no one even talks about anymore but Heartbreak Ridge due to its military theme and its popularity um, runs perennially it's never stopped running it's run all the time I don't make much money from it that's not <laughs> the reason I, I make the point but it's on TV all the time every Veterans Day Memorial Day Fourth of July, guarantee it's on, and it's, and it's just it's just a movie that has forever associated me with the United States Marine Corps, and it's something I I I embrace, and it's made me, an, or I think I've always been a, a patriot, but it's um, solidified my position, in you know some respects as, uh, and I've had many 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 Marines, to, and, I, and I'll say to me, hey, I'm a Marine, I saw Heartbreak Ridge, and I. Your character, Swede, motivated me uh, and excited me to, to join the Marine Corps. I've, wow. I've got thousands, thousands of these messages. And all I can say is I'm humble. Thank you for your service. And I've had many Marines tell me, and I'm like, look, I'm not, a, I'm not I don't want to, I can't, and I don't want to that responsibility of claiming that I'm actually military. I make that very clear to people. I don't want any confusion. But I've had many Marines say to me, it's very thoughtful, like we consider you, many of us consider you like an honorary Marine. And that makes, that, that makes me feel very good. And it's, but that's a, that's a, I respect all armed services, but I have a special place for the, the Marine Corps. Mm. Seems like you've rubbed shoulders with a lot of big actors as well at the time. Like, is, is, is there any sort of interesting behind the closed doors stories that are, that are worth sharing? Well, you know, my, 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 you know, in, in some respects, I, I, I own it. My, my, when I was a young actor, my, I was luckier than I was talented. And then, uh, and then I actually learned how to act a little better. And <laughs> it's always a work in progress. But, um, and, and mostly now I, I shoot uh, television commercials, but I'm auditioning all the time. And I was, but I was very, I was very fortunate when I was younger because shortly after I worked with Clint Eastwood, I worked with Burt Reynolds, you know, rest his soul. But he was a very, you know, he was one of the big stars in the world all through the 70s, early 80s. People think of Smokey and the Band yeah, and all these movies. Right. And, and, uh, it, it, and I don't know how many people knew this, but he, uh, you know, he played college football at Florida State. He's from the state of Florida. He was an All-American running back uh, as a high school kid, and then he went to Florida State. And, and in fact, you could find footage of him in a Florida State game, you know, running the ball down the field. But he had a terrible knee injury. And I actually met an NFL coach that was his teammate at Florida State. And that, that guy went on to, to be a, a coach later on. And I said, uh, you know, I, he goes, and he knew, this coach knew that I had made, I made not only a, a movie called Heat, but Burt Reynolds had a, a TV series called um, uh, um, uh, Evening Shade. It was a sit situation comedy, a sitcom, Evening Shade, ran in the 2000s. And so I'd worked with Bert a couple of times, and Bert loved to talk about football. He was really passionate about it. He was sorry that he had hurt his knee playing, you know, when he was in college, and he felt like he had maybe a chance to make it in the NFL. You know, he looked pretty darn good. And so that was a passion of his. And I always, you know, he, so he was inspirational to me. And I'm like, well, Bert's a football player, and he made it. I don't know if I'll ever be a star, but he was very, Bert went out of his way when he worked with me because he, he, he directed both these projects also to make sure that I had a lot of time and he helped me prepare and, and, and uh, rehearse. Generally speaking, as a professional actor, when you get hired, they expect you to know the lines perfectly, show up on time, hit the mark, say, roll the camera, and then do the scene, say, cut, and they don't, that's it, that's your job. And if they want you to do it again and again and again, you, whatever, you do it, and there's really not much conversation. That's the way 90% of Hollywood works. Burt Reynolds was like, Pete, let's take our time and let me help you with this. And he was just, it was like, a, it was like an acting lesson from a master. Yeah. So a very generous person, Burt Reynolds and, and Clint Eastwood, uh, 
I, I, I just, I still pinch myself. It was a long time ago, but I had that opportunity to, to learn from people at the top of their game. And, and because I have a, you know, a mindset where I, I try to turn myself into a sponge, my heart, my brain, and absorb all that. It was it was a tremendous opportunity, and and I and I learned from it. So I'm open to that. I I think it's important to um, you know, to to be open to those experiences. Uh, it it very similar to how I was able to learn from Howie Long and many others in the NFL. I was able to learn and I continue to learn from some wonderful people in Hollywood. What's the lessons that you've got that are worth sharing in terms of having mentors? You, you've been very fortunate to have some fantastic mentors, and it seems as though you're an avid learner, going back to school, learning about what you're doing still today. Like, how would you, what, what were some of the lessons and advice you would have about being able to move through life and, and, and being able to sort of um, find your way uh, to, to kind of get to where you want to get to, really? Yeah, I would encourage people of any age, but, but certainly it's, if you can start the younger, the better. And if you have an opportunity to, to, when you identify somebody that has the type of experience or knowledge that you want, and, and, and provided that it's for a good reason, nothing nefarious about it, but you, 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 see, you identify an expert in your field and you're like, wow, look at the way that person hits a tennis ball. And man, I, I'm aspiring as a, you know, to, to be the best. Maybe I, maybe I think I can play D1 in college and get a scholarship, something that's a beautiful hope. Uh, it, go up to that tennis player. It won't always go your way. You know, I grew up, and I recognize it now, but I had a lot of social anxiety growing up. I was a very nervous kid. I mean, I battled it for a long, long time in my adult life. And it restricted me. I, it was therapy that taught me this, you know, it was honestly, uh, uh, have someone help me reflect that I was, and I'm still slightly sad about the fact that sometimes I was so frozen. So folks with social anxiety will understand this, that you're like, wow, I just want to walk over to that person right there with nothing but goodness in my heart and ask them a question and, or introduce myself. And I was too frozen to do it. And that's a missed opportunity. But if, 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 and that's okay. And forgive yourself if that's what happened to you. But if you can figure out a way to get close to the people, identify them. It's, it's been called modeling. It's, there's other names for it. But you can always read. I have read many autobiographies and autobiographies. Um, they are invaluable tools if you you know so that that's one strategy and you know it's probably easier to find something a documentary or something on on youtube but you we must all i think to have a curious mind and to be gathering intel because there's so much that people that have that are older that have been there before you there's really not much new going on in this world there's just people that have become experts or highly proficient at whatever they do and you can and you'd be amazed at how generous most people are and say you know because you can th these are some of the hacks that are super useful when you're trying to get from point a to point b and i'm talking about people that are really interested in being high achievers um so pull out all the stops you know kind of psych yourself up and and identify the people that you want to get near or get next to or at least lean in on them. Um, and that ability to spot the right people for you, that takes some time. Mm. But continue to do your research. I'm, I'm, I'm a lifelong learner. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you because a lot of people, when they sort of typically, you get to a certain age, and it's like, okay, look, I've, I've kind of got to where I am. I've learned what I need. No, no, you, know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks kind of philosophy. But I, the thing I get from you is you're, you seem to have this thirst for knowledge which you would associate with someone about half of your age what 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 is it that drives you to continue to want to learn more as you go through your later yeah. years you know that you know the my my short and it's a bit flippant answer the first answer is like 
I'm a late bloomer, so I, I, I've always felt that way. It's kind of a weird feeling. I don't know that it's even true, and, and it sounds a bit like a cop out. So I kind of stopped saying it now. But 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 truly, I've um, because it took me so long to get over social anxiety, and I'm not perfect at it yet. But it it um, I, I I've realized that I had some some handcuffs on later in my life that I, through therapy and through reading the right books to to help me. I've learned a lot about myself and I've thought like since I, I'm not one of those guys that just came out of the gate and just boom, just career, uh, family and just, just some people come out hard and they just blow it up. They just ignite <laughs> it, you know, and that wasn't me. I, I'd done a lot of interesting things when I was younger, but it was like fits and starts and then the NFL and then the then I did some acting, and then, it, then that kind of dried up for a while. I mean, it was 12 years. I bailed on acting. I totally got out of the business. I opened up a gym, and I did, you know, there's really two things that, that get me excited, truth be told, and it's in, well, more than two, but two things that I could put my arms around and call a profession, and that's, that's fit, physical fitness and acting. So I actually put that on the shelf for a while and I needed a reset and I love physical fitness and that will never stop and that will always be my anchor. And, but then I, then through the encouragement of a, of a friend, a director friend, John Lacey, he said, you're too good to be on the sideline. Hollywood's, Hollywood's looking for you. And he encouraged me to get back into it and it went well. And I, God bless him for his encouragement. And by the way, there's a great story there. My friend, John Lacey, um, who's a wonderful actor and director and writer, and we're the same age. And we had we met many many years ago because my first agent was his first agent way way back, and we've kind of come in and out of each other's lives. He got a, had his family and moved to a different part of town, but then we always end up back as friends. And uh, it was twelve years ago now, yeah, that I was I was we ran into each other at a restaurant. And he says, you know, who, who's your agent now? What are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm out of it. Like, I'm, I've been out of it. And he goes, hold on a second. Whoa, 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 hold on a second. And he went over to his table and he goes, I'm, I'm, I need 10 minutes. And he came back and he goes, I don't mean, and he says, I need, to, I need your time for 10 minutes. I want to talk to you. I don't even want to wait. I want to talk to you now. And he goes, I thought something was up because I haven't seen you around. I haven't heard from you. I would see him at auditions and things because we're similar build a little bit. And he said, I, 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 I don't need to know why, except you can get back into this thing. Like, you don't have like something that you're not going to prison or something, right? Like, you can get back to this. And I'm like, no, yeah, I can get, yeah. And he goes, because we need you back. You know, whatever it takes to help you, I'll make a phone call this afternoon. I'll talk to my manager, whatever. And I said, no, no, don't, don't, don't go like that. Like, I can do it. I know how to do it. And he goes, and he goes so we're going to talk and we're going to stay in touch. And change my life. The point is, I think that God bless him, you know, when I don't think I, I don't think I looked distraught or distressed, but he felt so passionately about having that conversation with me and his encouragement. And I know he doesn't say it to every actor he meets. Um, and I think that we all have, you know, that potential to reach out to somebody with an encouraging word. You never know. You never, ever know how much that it might mean to that person. It meant the world to me. And it changed my life. How do you look at longevity and your fitness journey? I know you've got some, I've seen some interesting videos you've done about, I suppose, the more, what I'll call, mature athletes. Do you have a different approach now to your fitness and, and training routines and probably what you did in your 30s and 40s? And if so, what are, what are the, what, what's your approach now? Yeah, you know, I'm 61 and I've had... Um, four orthopedic surgeries in the last three years. And this was, you know, something, uh, I wasn't planning any of it. It all happened pretty quickly. So we all go through problems. A niece had a surgery to clean up my knee, which is the least of my, my worries. And then I had a, a hip replacement, which is a, a, a considered in, in our day and age, you know, kind of a slam dunk, positive outcome surgery. Mine went sideways, and the fact of the matter is 3% of those surgeries will. Um, and unfortunately, I was a part of that three. So um, having to kind of manage a, uh, a, a, a less than optimum outcome, the hip, the hip works, 
but it just didn't go the way I had hoped. It just happens. And then I had a, a very serious um, shoulder injury, rotator cuff, and I uh, so I'm, I'm eight months post-operative at this time, continue to rehab that, and it's going well. So, um, you know, these things happen, and we have to be, it's taught me to be, to be in the moment and to deal with it. I had six previous orthopedic surgeries from my playing days, but I was hope, hoping that that was behind me. I was, it's, it, it really came apart pretty fast. And not that I'm saying you, anybody should be, you know, preparing for something to, to go wrong with their health. I think just, I, it's taught me that I need to be agile enough to pivot and understand. So, so here's, where, here's where you go. And I've had so many direct messages. And that's one thing I love about the, my, my tribe and the people, because I encourage them, if you feel like you're suffering with a shoulder injury, or something I've gone through, um, go ahead and hit me with a direct message. And if I can offer some, because I've been there, I've been through this thing. Same thing with the hip, same thing with whatever you can name. I, I've probably had a surgery that affected my, my wrist and my neck. You know, I've had a lot of lower back. So I, but even if, but, but in general, overcoming the obstacles of a, of an, a, a physical problem. I, I kind of, I don't know if this is a very medical or fitness thing to, way to look at it, but I, I put the physical body when it comes to injury in two buckets. And one is, one is, one is joint, or it's orthopedic, which is ortho is Latin for bone. And, and then the other is metabolic. And that's like all the other stuff. That's like, wow, I'm obese and I've got type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure. My cholesterol is through the roof. I've got a, you know, a kidney disease or my, my, my uh, well, I've got a COPD, a lung disease. You know, these things, they happen all the time. So, you know, when I start to train people, I, I send them a health and fitness questionnaire. And I, because I, I want to know, it's a screener. And I want to know what I'm dealing with and so I can best serve them. And once I get to know people, uh, because most of the folks I work with are, you know, between 40 and their 60s, stuff starts going, things start going wrong. And so um, I look like I'm very, for, here's my situation. I'm very fortunate. I've never been sick a day in my life. I, as far as I know, I, I never had the flu. I think I've had a cold. Uh, I never got covid I, I, I mean, I literally never get sick. I, I've never had a disease, a metabolic disease. However, I've had 10 orthopedic surgeries. Um, that's what I got. I think I put a lot of stress in my body. I think that has something to do with it. If I go back in a time machine, I would change my training just a little bit. But you know, that having lived 61 years and been through all those things, that's what, that's in part what makes me an expert. Um, if I was 23, and never had an injury in my life. How in the world could I coach somebody that's in their 50s or 60s and going through stuff? Um, I, I don't know, except that I know where I stand and I know that instead of being uh, bummed out about the station that I am in my life and these rehabs, that I use it. And I, by the way, this, this is just a heads up for anybody who might be facing a, uh, whether a surgery or not, but if you're dealing with a, 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 a joint or a soft tissue injury, do your research. You know, I am, I am one of the things that makes me, I think, so as effective as I am as a coach um, is I do a lot of research and I've and there's a little bit of a trick to it. I'm good at it. I've studied it. I've, I, I know how to use the Internet. I know the websites and the resources that will best serve me. I know how to read data and I um, and I use all that to my advantage and I encourage everybody to do that and, you know, or uh, I literally was exchanging an email with somebody that said that they had a, uh, a rotator cuff injury. She says, I have a rotator cuff injury. You don't, I don't know this guy. I got a rotator cuff injury and the doctor says I need a shoulder replacement. Well, if you have a rotator cuff, if you have damage to the rotator cuff tendons, you're not a candidate for, I'm a lay person, but I've done my research. You're not a, you're not a candidate for shoulder replacement. There's, a, there's other surgical interventions, but this guy was mixed up, and I told him he was. But he needed to, in a night, in a polite way, I hope, uh, but he needed to get his facts straight moving forward with his doctor. I mean, I don't think his doctor was trying to cross him up. I just think this guy was unfamiliar, like most are, with that language. And so if you're heading towards a surgery, you better 
you know, familiarize yourself with what's going on. What's your view on food supplementation as you go through your 40s, 50s, 60s? Is there, are there any things that you found have, have helped in terms of your, your energy, your ability to sort of maintain and build muscle that, are, that maybe are not sort of commonly, commonly talked about? Yeah, I, and that's a great topic. And, and I would, I would, you know, we can. I, I would, I would add one. But be, this might be a disqualifier. But, but as important as your physical fitness, as important as a very it, supplementation. There, there's a, there's a, a small place. I, I'm mo- mostly critical of supplements because as a waste of money. Um, but there's a few that have real value, and it's becoming more and more evident. And there's some there's some websites out there. I'm just I'm just losing my, my thought on what the, the 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 one is where you you can really just kind of go online and get a deep dive. Again, if it's helpful if you understand how to read some of the, the data. But most most supplements most supplements aren't really benefiting people much. However, what is probably trending and becoming a bigger, more important topic to optimize your health as we age is, is getting your hormones straight, which is not my department. I, I'm good at staying in my lane. That's medical doctors. And, and within the, 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 the MDs and the DOs that it's, it's, it's a very specific, like all medicine has become so specific, but you know, hormone regulation, doing the blood tests and, and identifying that I work with a medical doctor that this is what he does, all he does for a living, understands, so he can optimize. It's actually um, not a hassle, and it's a simpler process. I think. I think most people should understand. It's not a. It's not a, a difficult thing to do to do, do a blood test and have your doctor, who is hopefully expert, say, um, "Here's how we can optimize where you're at, and what what will you know what and what you might be able to expect from that." And that would be maybe maybe you'll have more energy. Maybe you'll be able to build muscle a, a little better than you could when you when you were a sort of un, you were probably you might have been underperforming in your ability to to build any muscle due to you were just handcuffed by your hormone levels and it's fixable. So that's an important part of where we're at in terms of that that intersection of where physical fitness and strength training meets medicine. And I, I wish, I, my, I guess my message would be to folks, if you, you'll know it when you don't feel as well as you're used to and you feel like it's, you don't get a pump in your muscles and uh, that maybe, maybe you could benefit from examining that. To me, that's been uh, for about six years ago, I embraced uh, so hormone replacement therapy with a, a doctor and this is what he does. In fact, it, you know, he wrote a book that, that really dives into it. His name is Dr. Rand McLean in Santa Monica, and he wrote a book called Cheating Death. And it's just full of, of, of uh, and, it, and, it, and it's a very, very readable to the, to the lay person, but he goes category by category of how, of how you might best think about your, the way you're training, the way you're eating, your supplementation, your environment, daylight, vitamin D, overcoming obstacles, uh, the uh, mental approach, and it's, a be- it's just, a, just laid out beautifully and easy to read. It's, it's in the same category of a book is uh, um, outlived by Peter Atia. Peter Atia is much more, uh, much more dense, much more um, built for someone that uh, would be certainly useful to have a little bit of a biology, anatomy background, of certainly biology, and... Uh, and, and, uh, but, uh, Rand McLean kind of steers clear of that and just, just presents, he even gets into, uh, you know, tech watches, you know, in a, you know, like, like I'm wearing a Garmin, you know, watch, watches that, that give us data have as to do our resting heart rate, our sleep patterns, keeping track of our steps and all these things. Um, so in, so Dr. Rand McLean, even, he even gets into some of that. I find it very, very practical. So, so. We know there's a lot of information out there. The world is, is changing and improving data-driven information where, hey, I'm at this age, this station in my life. I want to be healthier. I want to feel better. I want to move better. I'm sick of feeling like this. I know there's something better for me out there. There's, there's folks like me. There's plenty of folks all over the place. Folks like you, 
Matthew, and then there's Dr. McLean and, and Dr. T. There's so many resources out there to people. Um, there's really no excuse. One thing about coaching, though, is coaching allows you to have actually somebody, in my case, virtually at least, somebody in your corner. That you, you can, you know, somebody that, you know, it's, it's not quite, I can't quite put my hand on your shoulder, but you can live anywhere in the world and we can, we can chop it up. We can, we can figure this thing out together, I'm pretty sure. And if not, you know, I'll, I'll, it's my nature just to do the research and figure it out, help you figure it out. What, what's your view on, on, on steroids then? Is, is, it, is it dependent on like having your blood work and seeing whether you need it or not? How, how, have you, how do you advise people around that from a safe perspective? Such a great question. And, it's, and this is like a chance for me. And I, again, um, as a non-medical person, may, maybe it's best that information just comes from me because I, I'm not here to sell anything, but you know, I, and I've done my reading, but I've also talked to my medical doctors, including Dr. Rand, and, and say, the, let, let's, let's be clear. So just, it's, it's important to understand there's a stigma attached to anabolic steroids where some people are out there that, um, and they go, oh yeah, I've heard that this athlete or this pro wrestler or this bodybuilder died young and they, they found he was taking a lot of steroids and it was very bad for this person. And, and then somehow that gets kind of conflated with hormone replacement therapy. So there, is there a little bit of crossover there? A little bit, but actually, but beyond, it, they're, they're separate and distinct topics. So um, hormone replacement therapy, as the name implies, it's simply there to replace the hormones that you were making naturally when you were younger or a different place in your life so that we can just, you know, that the doctors can optimize the way that you feel and perform. And it's, it's a, it's a, it's, I, in my judgment with a good doctor, it's a very uh, careful and concerned, it's rather I might go as far as say conservative, conservative approach to helping somebody optimize their, their health. And whereas uh, somebody who's on anabolic steroids that we read about in the news, they are taking, um, and I know this from experience because I was, I was in the, as an NFL player, I was on the periphery of that. I took steroids when I was in my 20s, but I, took, I was very fortunate to have a, a doctor and a mentor and we took very conservative amounts, only the amounts that were prudent, safe, and, and, and understood to be safe. And, but, but there's people out there, mostly men, that will abuse these drugs. And they take them, they, they, not only anabolic steroids, they'll include insulin and some, some drugs that'll make those, that, that really are, they're asking for trouble. And they're, and they're, they're simply not um, learned enough to, to know better or maybe arrogant, too arrogant to, to, to check themselves. And I just, and, and that's probably never gonna stop that abuse of steroids in this world. Uh, however, it's not to be confused with hormone, careful, medically supervised hormone replacement therapy, which is helping a generation of people to be their best. And I think that, I think truth be told, I, I used to be quiet about it, with my clients because I thought, let me stay in my lane. And I still am very polite about it. But when I work with folks that are middle-aged that have certain complaints that I hear from them, I will simply start the conversation by saying, do you work with a qualified medical doctor who's expert on hormone replacement therapy? If not, I suggest you do. Good, <laughs> interesting answer. What about natural alternatives? Is there anything that you know on that side that's, that's proven to, on your perspective to, to be successful? Y yeah, that's, you know, that's a big topic too and I've done a little digging into that and the data doesn't look really good, right? So, uh, and besides, I think, um, yeah, I mean, it just, it, just, it just doesn't feel like the right, uh, it just doesn't feel right to me because, you know, truth be told, like when, when I, I don't know, I'm going to think it was eight, 10 years ago. The first time I, 10 years ago, I really started to actually have uh, people in my lives, you know, that were very interested in their, their health and their fitness that were saying, I'm doing uh, 
testosterone replacement or, or, or hormone replacement therapy. And I was like, is, you know, and I'm like, is it, but what about, the, is it safe? Because you, what, what do you want? You want to make sure you don't get any, anything that's negative. So look, any, look, I think, I think we should all uh, go into taking a medication with the attitude of anytime you put something that isn't naturally occurring in your body or it's naturally occurring in your body, but you're putting more of it in, which is probably what the, it, hormone replacement therapy is. I mean, you have, there, there's always a chance there's going to be a negative reaction to that. And there are, and there are, and it, I mean, make no bones about it. That's why you need an expert because you don't want things to go sideways. A common, a common problem with um, people in, in hormonal replacement therapy, when it's not done right, is they can, it's, it's funny, either you get hair growing where you don't want it, or where you want it, you get, a, you get less of it. <laughs> so your doctor needs to find those balances, how do they do it, through testing your blood on a regular basis. So I've, I've been in the middle of that discussion too, so I, I want everything to be honky-dory, and that's why I work with a professional. So why anybody would want to try an over-the-counter version? I don't. I don't think. I, don't, I wouldn't recommend that. I don't think there's. I don't think there's much happening there. No. One of the things that the research has proven there's a, there's a lot of, I guess, podcasts and articles about this now is the is the damage alcohol does to you and um, how it affects. I've, I've been sort of reading it quite a bit myself now. But it, I guess where you are in, in um, Los Angeles and Santa Monica area, there's, there's a big movement towards things like cannabis and mushrooms as, as almost alternatives to alcohol. Mm. Where, do you, where do you sit on that from a health perspective? Like, are you against all of them? Are you saying alcohol is good? What, how, what, what's your perspective on, on all of those? Man, that's such a good question. I, and I, you know, I look to the experts on topics as complex as that and I think it really is complex and I think that in California where pot stores are all over the place I think that we are living in the middle of a, a longitudinal experiment that the data points are still out there and we need, we need to, to you know it's going to be a while before we can collect enough inf information to truly understand that one of my favorite um podcast you know doctors is uh Dr. Drew, Dr. Drew Pinsky. Oh, and, no, I heard that one. And, and yeah, he's a local Los Angeles. He's got a, a nationwide uh, following. But Drew Pinsky, uh, Dr. Drew, is expert on um, drug addiction, complications, alcohol, things like that. And I've heard him address that topic many times. He doesn't like, he doesn't like uh, the... I, I don't want to speak for him, but he's very, very cautious. He said the... The, he said that being uh, a, a cannabis addict is not possible. He said that's a misnomer. You can be addicted to pot. And I didn't know that. I, you know, I don't have any real experience with cannabis or marijuana. So I, but I do know people that have benefit from it, the gummies and the different ways that you can take it. Now, I think everybody knows somebody that's benefited from that in some way some people somebody um and it's something that i think we all need to keep an eye on you know you make a good point because if more people you know how do we alcohol is problematic and did you hear the huberman um podcast on alcohol? yeah it's yeah it's pretty scary it's <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, it, man, those days of, you know, ah, two drinks a day and if you could just, you know, shut it down after that, you're good to go. And now that seemed, now that might be poison, you know. Uh, yeah, so, you know, the, the more we roll, you know, but here's the thing. I, I just want to be mindful of this, you know. The, the, so the older I get and, and, the, and, the, and the more I, I keep track of this is... We don't get a lot of good news. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, it's always, they're always finding something else that's going to kill us. And uh, I don't know. I, it's probably enough said on that topic. I, I don't, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't believe there's anybody that doesn't have any vice, you know, that, that doesn't have some 
some mark on them. Uh, and um, I mean, I don't want to just like dismiss everything, but if I think, I think, I think, um, I think, I don't think anybody could push back on this. If you, if you could just avoid smoking um, and not getting hit by a car or in a car wreck, you know, you increase your odds of living a long life like exponentially. So smoking is number one by, by a mile in terms of um, activities that we can participate in that are just like legal and it's, it's a choice. And, uh, you know, Peter Thiel lays out a lot of great data on this stuff. I know my, I know my doctor friend, Rob Heisinga, internal medicine, and he's got a lot of patients that are like, you know, kind of middle-aged executive and like live in Malibu and, and like this. And he was telling me, I don't, think, I don't think he would mind me saying that many of them, are that their, their hobby, their enjoyment is, is bicycle, you know, those, like those road bikes, like Tour de France, and they get on Coast Highway and they get all that. And he, he says, like, outside of smoking, the next, best, the next thing you want to stop is that bicycle. Like, get it inside. Get it off the road. Yeah. It's so dangerous. Mm-hmm. And, and he goes, and he's like, he'll show them the data. Like, people getting hit on bikes. Like, I, I, don't, I, don't, I have no dog in that fight. But there's decisions out there that, you know, we all need to come to terms with. Can I have a drink? Do I want to take a bike ride? You know, and uh, so look, so we're all in there, and we all, you know, and you know, in, in curious minds, you know, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna scoop all this stuff up. But at the end of the day, I also try to think like, let me just go and uh, hug my dog, go for a walk. You know, I think it'll be okay, yeah. <laughs> and then keep on picking up heavy stuff. Yeah, the I, I know around, I, I think. Southern Northern California, there's there's the this this mushroom legalization now as well, which which seems to be there, there seems to be a number of interesting research coming out on that as well. What, what where is that something you've read much about? You know, yeah, I think who's the the go to? Uh, it's Tim Ferriss, right? The psilocybin, he's the expert on that. I haven't been listening to him as much lately because he gets that son of a gun. He got me started listening to podcasts. And he really goes down some 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 very complicated you know conversations with uh, learned people. Um, I, I don't I don't you know I like, again like anecdotally I know people that you know take the mushrooms for the experience, swear by it, uh, and they've had very little downside to it, and, it, and uh, it's an occasional thing. I don't I don't know. I haven't done that, so I don't know how all that works and and I, again everybody's a little bit of a uh you know an experiment you know there, there was a i don't know I remember the guy's name but i was, was re- you know i've kind of interested in a little bit of the history of medicine history of sport things like that interest me and it was a, there was a medical doctor in the 18 maybe 1700s an american and he was interested highly interested in the digestive system so what he did what he would he would take a uh, piece of cooked steak and he tied it to a string and he swallowed it <laughs> and, <the> string. <laughs> and he and then he would he would time it like for how many hours like a day or two days or a day or whatever and then he would he would retrieve it and he would examine it and then he did this many many times and then he so he was able to calculate a race a, a, a pace or of digestion <laughs> And I'm like, so when people say like, what is, what is, what is that guy about? I'm like, that's a scientist. Mm. That's a guy that not only went to medical school, but is still performing experiments and he's not afraid to use this guy. So that's a, when you're experimenting, using yourself as a, an experiment and I, and that's what me and you, cause you're very fit. That's what me and you are doing in the weight room. Uh, we, we I, I, I don't think it's too far adrift to say we're, we're scientists and works. I encourage people I train that are a little bit timid. They like follow the program. I write them like exactly. I'm like, all right, you're doing uh, curls with the dumbbells. How about the machine? You got a machine in your gym? 
because you can get some, well, I don't know, should I use that? Yeah, try that. See what you get the best outcome with. And I encourage everybody to, and, and, and the reason I started to say, I encourage people to try different things within reason is to say, when I started reading about scientists and science and, and scientific method, I was like, that, that's, that's applicable to so many things in life. I want to encourage people. I want, I'm, I mean, I'm a, I'm a coach, but really I'm a teacher. You know, a coach, you know, what does a teacher do? Teach, you spend enough time with a teacher. Let's say it was, you know, you, you took a geometry class. At the end of, you know, 12 weeks, you know geometry. Or a French class, now you can speak French. Hey, they didn't keep it. They gave it to you. You worked for it, but it was a collaborative effort. That's a teacher. So that's, that I want, because I want people, I want, evan- I'm an evangelicist. I want, I want people to, I, I've had a, just a couple of people in my life that after I coached them, they went out and got a personal training uh, certification. That made me feel so good, right? So I want people to take what I teach them and, and construct their own programming and fitness for the rest of their lives. That's when, I, that's when I feel best. Yeah, I'm always here for you for support and conversation. But I want you to own this stuff. Everybody should own what I know. Maybe not quite to my level because I've committed so much of my life to it. But we all should understand, understand the fundamentals of physical fitness. When we're done with high school, no different than we understand the fundamentals of mathematics so that at least we can take a look at our checkbook and know what's going on. Mm. I think it's interesting what you say because I, I guess there are things that we're told, well, don't try this and don't do that. And some of the things you're not going to really know for a long time, but I, I suppose if you've got a general direction to say, look, you know, I want to live the optimal life and do, do the research, but I, I suppose in some areas, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm like, you know, I experiment with different pieces of equipment, different foods, and it, you, I think you kind of have to keep experimenting as you go through life, because you don't really, you know, things change. Like even I was reading recently about nicotine and, and how, um, not, not I do nicotine, but there's, there's a a lot of people talking about how in the right way, I'm not sure whether you, whether you eat it or do something with it, but how it, it has real positive impacts on the brain yeah. and a number of things. Obviously, smoking, it's probably not quite as good. But I, I think there are a lot of things that you can sort of stay away from. But, uh, you know, so how do you know there's, there's, there's something there? Um, you know, def- definitely, as you say, smoking, it's, it's quite clear what that does. So it's, that's probably not something you want to experiment with. But there, there's, there could be things which... Um, Maybe in life we just, particularly as we get older, it's like, well, that's not for me, that's not for me, I can't do this, I can't run. And, and your life becomes sort of very, fairly narrow in, in that you put yourself in this little box and that's where you end up. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's almost like not, a, not an interesting place to be heading towards, is it? Yeah, no, there's been, there's <laughs> been well, there's been so many mistakes that, that, that I've made that most all of us have made over the years in, in hopes to be as physically fit and strong and healthy as we can. I don't know how many countless egg yolks I threw out because all I wanted was, you know, all the yolk was poison. I just want to, you know, I just want to eat the egg whites. Well, why do we all, we all eat the, the, the yolks now with very few exceptions. Um, there's, there's you know, uh, half the protein content of the egg is in the yolk. All the minerals and vitamins are in the yolk. And I was throwing those out for years until I finally figured out, no, I want to eat that whole leg. I want the benefit. I want the protein. I want all those minerals and vitamins. It's one of the most important foods in my diet. I had four eggs for breakfast this morning. So, um, and we're going to, that, that's going to happen. We're going to make those mistakes. Um, uh, again, as I think we live in such an interesting time because we, I mean, just, just even when I was in high school, I remember the food pyramid, which has been, which was a disaster and it's been replaced by, you know, the food plate, which is just another disaster with a different shape to it, I guess. <laughs> um, but uh, we, you don't, yeah, you don't want to look to the federal government for any information. You want to look to the, the, the smartest people out there. And by the way, so we, we, you know, we, if you're not, uh, you know, if you're my age or older, you really understand the fact that we were, it was so difficult. I mean, you had a Find a go to a library, find a book, and start to investigate things just to figure anything out. Now it's it's just it's right in your hand mm-hmm. on your phone, and just Google it, and then you can have an incredible. In fact, it's all, all, it's gone the opposite way. It's overwhelming how much data there. So we have to filter through that. It takes a little bit of a trick. Find the experts. 
pay attention to them, understand something from the from medical doctors on down, advice that they've been giving over the years has been with, with good intentions, it's been bad. And we, we have to just be agile enough to correct the ship as we go. I, I know that I train people in a different way. I, and I, I, many, many years ago, I, I, I decided that I would, I would talk to my, my clients and, and share this and because I was living this philosophy, but I wanted to articulate it to them because I think it's useful. And that is when I write the programming for your, your strength training, your cardiovascular exercise, which is a little bit, my, my style is a little bit complex. It's going to include interval training. It's going to include steady state training. It's, it's helpful to use a, a watch or a strap that's going to man, mon, monitor your heart rate. It's a bit complex, but it's going to be, it's going to, it's going to pay dividends. And I say everything, everything that I have written that I believe will help you safest, in the safest possible way, most expeditiously move your, you from this station of this body fat, this level of strength to that level, leaner, stronger, to do it as smoothly, safely, quickly as possible. All of it's based in principles. Principles are few. Principles don't budge. The principles that go behind resistance training, progressive overload, etc. The details... What exercise should I choose to develop my shoulders? Because I want to have beautiful shoulders and I want them to be safe and functional. Well, we've got a lot of different choices out there. We've got machines and barbells and dumbbells and all this great stuff. It it's, can almost be, if you thought of it, it's good for body weight and push-ups even work your front deltoid beautifully. And so, but those are, as well on principle, the principles are we need to put the deltoid muscle under mechanical tension. That's, that's how... That's how we engage the muscle fibers, put them to work, actually kind of destroy them just a little bit, and then through recovery, proper recovery, give them a little rest, proper, supported by proper nutrition, good sleep, that muscle will come back stronger and bigger than it was before when we repeat that. But that only, that's, that's called super, super compensation, but that only happens when we do the first thing is placing that muscle under mechanical tension. It doesn't matter if you use a dumbbell, a barbell, a machine, body weight, or rubber tubing. Your body doesn't know the difference, but it has to be sufficient mechanical tension to elicit the response, right? And all of that, all of that, that's a, that's a principle, but should I, if I take, a, but taking a dumbbell, I'm going to take a dumbbell, or in the next, but no, I think I'll, I'll, use the, I'll use the machine next time. Those, those aren't principles, those are methods. Methods are many. It's the imagination. It's you design fitness and strength equipment. How grand is your imagination that you can maybe come tweak, tweak the position so that I can pull and I'll really feel that in my lats and my, 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 my trapezius. And those are all um, methods. And the methods is the fun part. And, you can, and they go on forever and there's not a yes and a no. There's just what works best for you. So once you have that principal understanding of what you're doing when you're strength training, the world is yours. Any unfulfilled goals and, and challenges that, you, uh, that, you, that you're sort of thinking about next? You know, I'm, I'm living it and it's ongoing. And I, and I think it's going to dovetail in a few ways that um, are starting, starting to happen in my life. And I think there's going to be more of it. But but because my principal goal is to help as many people as I can, that's it. I mean, that's it. So um, some years ago when I remember the moment because I was using Instagram and it was kind of new and, uh, and I had this notion. I was, I was talking to my training partner and we were at Gold's Gym. And I said, you know, uh, Instagram, which was made for posting photos, now they let you... Uh, post a video and I did a little research on it but it had a, a limit of 60 seconds and that's the way it was way back and I said you know because I would sometimes like take a picture I would say to my training partner I'm going to do this exercise take a picture of me and then I'll say something about it or I don't know and I said that's kind of lame you know but I said make a video of me and uh and I'm going to teach I'm going to I'm going to show you how to do an exercise and I'm going to ma make a few comments about it and then I want to, you know, I'm an actor and I'm, I understand, the, you know, uh, you know, marketing a little bit and things. And I said, well, I want to have some fun with this. And, and I, at the end of it, I said, um, I said, and I showed the exercise. I said, this 
trains this deltoid, a medial deltoid, and, and uh, my name is Pete Koch, making you better, 60 seconds at a time. And I thought, that's kind of cool. And she goes, oh, that's cool. And then I said, hold on a second. Who the hell's got 60 seconds? Oh, let's do it again. And we did it again, except I said, making you better 30 seconds at a time. Hey, well, he's got 30 seconds, you know? And, and she goes, no, that's even better. That's even better. So I, to, the, to date, I've made more than 500 videos where I demonstrate an exercise or talk about a topic related to health and fitness. And I say, making you better 30 seconds at a time. And so... Uh, and it's really helped me gain a lot of popularity. And, and, and some people have said to me, so why, why do you do that anyway? And I said, you know, so I, and just before that, that one night, the first time I asked my training partner to film me, I had been reading a quote, some, some quote, I've read a quote from um, Albert Einstein. And he said, aspire not to be a man of worth, but rather a man of value. And I said, you know, if I make this, and it might be of value to somebody because they didn't quite understand the, the proper technique or what muscle, whatever, that they were, and, and there's got to be value in that. And it's free, right? And I'm not looking for worth on this. It's going to be free and just put it out there. And it's been one of the best things I ever did. And I think it came from a good place and it came from my heart. And so now people, people will routinely say to me, I like your, and they always botch it. They'll go, I like your 30 second workouts. So I'm like, no, they're not, you know, they're not 30 second work, but I, I know what you're saying. And I appreciate that. So that's, that's, that's how I've, um, I know I've had people say, I've been watching your making you better 30 seconds at a time videos for five years. And it's really helped my workouts. And I'm like, that's, that's it. I know, I know I'm doing something right. Final question, Pete. Escape Your Limits is about escaping what you've believed is impossible and gone on to make possible. What would be one of your most memorable examples of escaping your own personal limits? Well, you know, when I, when I, for me, you know, football has provided, you know, the, it's, it's, it's been the, uh, the, the, the vehicle that's taken me through my life, it's been, and it even, in, in some sense, even as a player long retired, it's, it's such an important part of my life. I was honored um, last week to be invited to the Raiders, which is now the Las Vegas Raiders. They have, uniquely to the NFL, they have an alumni group. Uh, there's a few other organizations that have a group that is, um, that, that they actually stay in touch with their former players. But the Raiders have the most organized of them and they invite every single one of their former players uh, to Las Vegas. Previous to that, it was to Northern California when they were still in Oakland. And this has been going on for seven years and I've been able to participate in four of these uh, Raiders alumni weekends. And, all, and the rule is like this, if you just show up, get yourself to the location, no matter where you live, Everything from the hotel to the food to the meals to the alcohol to the whatever the entertainment whatever is going on plus tickets to the football game it was a preseason game it's all paid for by the Raiders and what it does is it animates in this case three hundred former Raiders ten Hall of Famers big big name guys Marcus Allen and. And Jim Plunkett and these, these legendary players and they show up and most of them bring their, it's a plus one, you know, you bring your wife and your girlfriend and it's such a blessing. So it's, it's really, and Mark Davis, the owner of the Raiders is, uh, he's a blessing. Uh, I played for his dad, his dad, Al Davis. I know this, this is, I'm really getting down into the weeds of, of the NFL and the Raiders, but you know, it's, um, the, the NFL was a popular sport when I played it's, and it's, 20 times bigger now and uh, just to be a, a, a little clog you know in that that wheel and to be honored because for most players once they retire they really won't even hear anything from the team they play for so they're just on their own and there's some various alumni uh, former players organizations around cities of America, across America but they don't really do much play golf stuff like that but this is very special so football has you know, and I give my, I'll give myself credit, my, my commitment and dedication to do everything that I could possibly do to be the best football player I could be. That's all I knew I had control of. The rest was, we'll see how, we'll just have to see how it goes. But some things went my way, and I 
played six seasons in the NFL, and it uh, it's been such a blessing. So I, I want I just want to make I just like to let folks know that the Raiders are a special organization in my heart. They, there's they're not just billion dollar. Not all of them are just bill, billion dollar organizations, which, which is what they are. But they also do a lot of good, and that and that organization gives a lot to charity. And um, it, it you know we most of us you know live. We all do, uh, and I do even. Uh, I've got some flash in my life, but mostly my life is pretty regular. It's pretty mundane, and we live regular lives. But it's uh, when we have an opportunity, in my case, to, to have been aligned with uh, some, some very special people, you realize um, it's, it's the people that make all the difference. And, and that, that kind of goes full circle back to starting out as a kid that was really had this social anxiety, which is a really terrible thing. It, it makes you suffer. And to realize that I've got some people, you know, the older you get, I think the more you sort of, you might be sensitive to people thinking, you know, you're, you're important to me. And there was a lot of that going on amongst the, uh, the former players, and it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Pete, thank you very much for your time today. I appreciate you. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you've got any value from it whatsoever, then please do us a favor, like, subscribe, tell somebody, and that will help us to be able to continue to do more of these and help you escape your own personal limits. Thanks for listening.